Hi, welcome to Fifth Avenue Baptist online Bible study for the week of Sunday, October 3rd. I'm Katie Scholl, and I'll be guiding you on our final week of the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll be going through Matthew 7, uh, verses 15 to 29 together. But before we begin, let's go ahead and open with prayer. Lord Almighty, we bow before you now and ask for our minds, hearts, and ears to be inclined towards your word. Help us to be hearers of your son's teaching and to live like we belong to him. In the name and spirit of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Over the past four weeks, we've been reminded just how countercultural the Sermon on the Mount is. Jesus laid out for his first century listeners, and now for us, an upside down kingdom, very much at odds with the secular world. As we studied the Beatitudes, we saw that Jesus's idea of being a blessed person is completely out of sync with the world's concepts of happiness or blessing. As we studied Jesus's teachings about anger and retaliation, we realized he saw both of those things as far more dangerous than we ever do. As we studied his thoughts on giving alms, praying, and fasting, we saw that everything we do in life is to be done before an audience of one. Sorry, I have kids and dogs in the house today. And last week, we heard Jesus tell us to enter through a narrow gate. We saw that doing so involves being accepting of others, discerning, confident in prayer, and loving in all of our relationships. This week, we cover the last 15 verses in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus speaks about three different topics. Doing the will of God and not merely talking about it. Looking honestly at who we are and what we do. And building our lives on a truly solid foundation. So we'll go ahead and start by reading the entire passage together. Um, that's Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 29. <clears throat> Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. Starting at 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against, the, against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. A few years ago, when I was leading a yoga teacher training program, I had a group of trainees who just weren't doing the work. We met one weekend a month, and in our weekend together, we would introduce the new concepts, anatomy, and postures for them to study in the month ahead. They also had assignments in practice and teaching that would serve as evidence of their personal study and practice for, for me. Um, 
as they were being guided through a particular sequence by one of our co-teachers, um, I was observing, I was able to see very little physical evidence of their practice. They may have been able to go through the motions, but not with any sort of physical integrity. And they definitely weren't embodying the discipline that I knew had been taught that was their practice for that month. We had to talk about this and a new challenge was issued to them. I reminded them of our commitment to each other during this time, to the group and to our future students to practice what we were studying personally, not to just gain head knowledge and memorize facts. We had to live it. When the doctor tells you to give up sweets and carbs to regulate your blood sugar, you're, you're learning a new skill uh, like my yoga trainees or practicing for a sport, it's not enough to merely listen to the advice and instructions given to you. Hearing words doesn't help us unless we put it into practice. How could my yoga trainees expect to teach others to embody the different shapes find internal and external alignment or still the mind with their breath if they weren't practicing themselves. Change comes when we take what we've heard to heart and live it. When we learn from a teacher who has integrity, it makes it easier to do what they advise, or I guess it makes it easier to want to do what they advise as well. It's the same with matters of faith. Hearing Christ's words is not enough. We need to put them into practice. And as the Sermon on the Mount comes to a close, Jesus expresses his wish that his disciples will do more than simply hear his words. He wants them to act on what he said. True followers of Jesus put his words into practice by obeying his commands. We can identify Jesus' disciples by their obedience to Christ. One of the problems Jesus' disciples in that day faced was how to identify those who were truly among his followers. Some people claimed to speak for Jesus while actively preying on or profiting from the community of disciples. Others believed they were following Christ because they were doing the right things, but they missed the point that discipleship begins as a commitment of the heart. Jesus wanted his followers to know how to identify one another. And as he closes the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warns his disciples against two groups who fail to obey his words, false prophets and the self-deceived. He warns about false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And that's in verse 17. Both the Old, New, Old and New Testament describe people who pretend to speak for God. The Old Testament records some prophets claim to speak for God, but declared whatever message the kings or people in power at the time wanted to hear. New Testament letters indicate that churches contended with false teachers. Some said Christians had to follow the Jew Jewish law in order to be saved. Some mixed pagan religious teachings with Christianity, and some denied the resurrection of Christ and suggested people could gain a deeper, secret, more spiritual knowledge apart from Christ. In verse 16, Jesus says, We can know them by their fruits. The word fruit describes the evidence of a life lived in obedience and submission to Christ. Do they demonstrate humility? Do they grieve over the sin in their lives and in our world? Do they hunger for righteousness? Do they seek to make peace with those around them? Do they treat others as they want to be treated? Or do they practice their piety as a show, profiting off those who follow them and then casting them aside? The fruit of a person's life will tell us to whom their allegiance belongs. We must also remember fruit takes time to develop 
And similarly, the evidence of a person's life takes time to re reveal itself. Therefore, we must be cautious about rushing to judgment when a person claims to speak for Jesus. As time allows their true character to show, some will prove worthy and others will face God's judgment. In verse 19, we hear every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. False prophets knowingly deceive others. But some people delude themselves into thinking they are faithful followers when they are not. This is a situation Jesus describes in verses 21 to 23. He gives the example of people calling him Lord, but they won't be able to enter the kingdom because he doesn't actually know them. Because they only talked a good game, they won't be welcomed. What we shouldn't miss in these verses is the possibility of self-deception in our own lives. The people Jesus refers to thought of themselves as upstanding Christians only to discover they were upstanding in their own eyes, but not in God's. It is important to remember that neither words nor actions alone are proof a person is following Christ. The true mark of a disciple is a life rooted in the relationship with God. Following Christ is more than a matter of lip service. Following Christ as Lord means trusting his grace and committing our allegiance to him alone. <clears throat> our allegiance is demonstrated in our actions. Verse 22 tells us that great deeds, even miracles, are not proof of a Christ follower. In verse 23, the use of new implies like, uh, let me find the verse, sorry. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So when he uses new, that word implies a relationship of intimacy. For Christ to know us, we must have a relationship with him. Calling Jesus Lord means nothing if we fail to live like he is Lord. We bear the fruit of a life rooted in relationship with God when we cultivate it by hungering for God's word, practicing holiness, glorifying God in worship, and communing with God in prayer. The Sermon on the Mount outlines the ethics of the kingdom of God, and a radical transformation is birthed in us as we walk in relationship with God. Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount with his famous story of the houses built on the rock and the sand. He compares those who hear his words and act on them to someone who built his house on a rock. When the rain fell and the waters rose, the house on the rock stood firm. In the same way, a life built on Christ's foundation can stand firm in the storms of life and we will all face storms. We build on this solid foundation by hearing Jesus's words and acting on them as told in verses 24 and 25. In verse 26 and 27, he tells us what it looks like when we don't live a life faithfully before God, guided by the teachings and example of Jesus and supported by the pillars of prayer and Bible study. Jesus compares those who hear and fail to do uh, fail to do to a foolish man who built his house on sand. What listeners do will determine the outcome of their lives. We can learn three lessons from the last part of this sermon. Every house will be tested by a storm. We have to prepare for the storms before they arrive. We have a guide for surviving whatever storms come our way. How do we prepare our lives for the inevitable storms we have to face? We read Matthew 5 to 7, study it and make it a priority to live what we read. We live in a world that constantly offers us recipes for success or the five-step plan to the good life. 
I saw the other day, um, I don't even remember how I got there. <laughs> there was uh, one of those, you know, threads where you get an email, you click on the link and there's an ad on the site or something. Um, but I, I actually clicked on it and it was, it was for a Christian coach. Now, before anybody who's in the coaching industry hears this <laughs> and says, or, hey, I've used a coach and that was really helpful. I'm not against that. I have definitely fallen prey to those. I have had coaches and benefited tremendously. I have been a coach for others in in many ways um, in the yoga industry. But this was one of those examples of if you follow me, if you follow my teachings, then you will finally realize your God-given potential and live this life of abundance that is promised to each of us as children of God. Now, if this person were only teaching scripture, I might be more inclined. However, I'm not sure that all of these people are solely out there to profit from profit from Jesus' disciples, but some of them are. Um, some of them think that they hold the keys. They hold the answers. When all these plans, though, when when I laid them out against the teachings found in the Sermon on the Mount, all of these plans that I've bought that I've um, clicked on and read about, uh, gone through the sales funnel, been on their mailing lists. All of these plans seem flimsy when compared to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has already given us a brilliant handbook for living that none of these false prophets can match or modern plans can match if we take it to heart and live its truths we will be ready for whatever storms come. Matthew tells us when Jesus finished his sermon, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes in verses 28 and 29. Jesus's opponents turned the vibrant, rich and life affirming Jewish religion into a mass of archaic laws and boring legalistic traditions. Then Jesus. Then Jesus came along speaking to the real issues that real people had to deal with daily. His words were exciting and relevant and the common people were astounded. His words were not just for the teachers of the day. They were not just for the priests. They were for whoever listened, for everyone. As we've studied the Sermon on the Mount, I have felt the same way. I've been reminded how truthful and relevant this message is for our present day life. Much has changed over the centuries but the basic hungers in the human heart have stayed the same. The hunger to experience God, the hunger to love and be loved, the hunger to experience joy and to make a difference in the world. The Sermon on the Mount is timeless because it addresses these hungers. In the study of this passage, we can sense that Jesus understands the hurts and hungers of life far better than most of our modern teachers and experts. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the timeless truths in the Sermon on the Mount. In light of our passage today, we pray that we will be honest in looking at our own lives so we may bring forth good fruit. In your son's name we pray, amen. Thank you, friends. Someone else will be with you next week, and I look forward to joining you and listening to the upcoming studies. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out or comment. Um, I have really enjoyed the Sermon on the Mount and studying it in this way. 
um, it's probably the first time I've really looked at it in its entirety in this way and and applied it to life and man. It's I just want to plaster it everywhere <laughs> uh, so that I can constantly be reminded of the truth that it holds. Have a great week. Thank you.